like. This is probably the least gung-ho David in Italian art, and he's manifestly put off by the gross dripping trophy in his hand. It's thought that Goliath was a self-portrait, and some critics believe that the David is too, but of a younger Caravaggio. Whether such allegories were meant or not, one is left with his psychological insight, and that was more real in its perceptions than any other Italian painters of the time. This Narcissus turned into a circle by his reflection in the pool still wears Georgian's costume, brocade, slashed hose, but the thickness of the dark around him gives his image a peculiar drama by stressing the isolation of self-love. What Caravaggio now needed was a great occasion to rise to, a big commission that would consolidate his work, and the Cardinal Del Monte got it for him. On July 23rd, 1599, he was commissioned to paint two scenes from the life of St. Matthew for the Contarelli Chapel of the Church of San Luigi dei Francesi in Rome. A third was called for two years later, and these were the pictures that made his name. The painter of boys and fruit now became a famosissimo pittore, a heavyweight. The first of his proofs was the calling of St. Matthew. It's set in what seems to be a real room, and we may be looking at Caravaggio's own studio in Palazzo Madama. Christ has come in on the right with an apostle. He points, and behind him, from a window out of frame, high up on the wall, a beam of light breaks in and washes over the group at the table. St. Matthew and his young companions, dressed in those familiar Giorgione costumes. The light is transfiguring. It's a blaze of grace. What an invention. Caravaggio paints a supernatural event without losing one fraction of the density of real life. There's a subtle division between the worldly figures at the table, dressed in modern costume, and the spiritual presences of Christ and his companions and Peter, whom Caravaggio has turned into messengers from a point outside of historical time by clothing them in classical draperies. Moreover, some of the drama of the picture, at least, comes from Caravaggio's throwaway lines. He resists the temptation to put Christ in the foreground, and all we see of him is the head, the shoulder, and the imperious pointing hand. So one tends to read the picture from left to right, starting with the group at the table, and then, like them, discovering the source of their astonishment. The next part of the narrative was St. Matthew and the Angel, Caravaggio did two versions of it, and this was the first. It was destroyed by a bomb during World War II, but it had never got into the Contarelli Chapel anyway because the priests rejected it. Why? Decorum. St. Matthew looks like a puzzled bumpkin learning his ABCs, and those intrusive feet of his would have been right above the high altar. But mainly it's thought the picture was rejected because of the winsome sexiness of the angel whispering sweet revelations in his ear. No matter, the Marchese Giustiniani bought it to go with his victorious love, and Caravaggio did another version, this one, with less body contact. The figure of St. Matthew writing his gospel on that ordinary trestle table has a tremendous and antique gravity. He might equally well be Cato or Socrates. And again, the darkness around him gives those folds in the red toga a density like sculpture. No doubt, the vision of the angel flying down in that swirl and flutter of drapery was inspired by some classical carving that Caravaggio had seen in Rome, and yet how very unclassical the angel's gesture is. You could see it in a shop or a tavern, no doubt Caravaggio did. Elementary teaching, one, two, three. But the painting on which Caravaggio's future development would turn was the martyrdom of St. Matthew. It's a bewildering picture, a sublime hodgepodge. The setting is almost illegible. A church altar, steps, a suggestion of gloomy columns. An angel writhes down on a very unconvincing cloud to give the palm of martyrdom to St. Matthew, who is prostrate on the steps, while an almost naked executioner prepares to skewer him. This splendid figure of the Carnefice, the headsman, is the hub of the picture. Round him there's a churning and flickering of limbs and bodies in a black void. They're all falling back in various degrees of terror. The witnesses, whoever they are, in their modern dress, 
the half-naked giants, whoever they may be, at the bottom corners of the picture, the panicking boy turning to run. And the only one who seems not to be in shock is right in the background, and his face is Caravaggio's self-portrait. He wanted to make an elaborate show of his tenebroso, the lights and the darks. The light is as abrupt as a flash photo. It freezes the gestures with what looks to us like documentary reality. You're aware of one sixtieth of a second of time. What's more, the light does not model the bodies it falls on, it snatches them into view. It slides over a form to a certain line, and then it stops, and the dark begins. For his darkness isolates gesture, movement, the grimace of mouths and the splaying hands, and raises the psychological pitch of every expression. Caravaggio finished the martyrdom of St. Matthew in 1600, and when the three big pictures were hung in the Contarelli Chapel, they did exactly what he hoped they would do they made him famous. From this point on, the imitators multiply and the commissions pour in and the criticism mounts. Pietro Bellori complained that now began the representation of disgusting things. Some artists began to revel in filth and deformity. If they had to paint armor, they chose the rustiest. The costumes they painted were stockings and breeches and large hats and they gave all their attention to the wrinkles and defects of the skin and the outlines depicting knotted fingers and limbs disfigured by disease. Now in the event, all that the Caravaggisti could imitate was the shell and stage props of Caravaggio's work and the real lesson to be drawn from his art, that extraordinary overlap between epiphanies and ordinary substances needed a Velasquez or a Georges de la Tour or a Rembrandt to carry it on and complete it. What the first wave of Caravaggio's Roman imitators must, I suppose, have been looking at, apart from the genre scenes, was the next big set of commissions that he did, the martyrdom of St. Peter and the conversion of St. Paul for the Chirazzi Chapel in Santa Maria del Popolo in 1600. Today, the martyrdom looks formal, even classical, a big tilted X. It's been said of Caravaggio that he never painted rhythms, only vectors, lines of force, and there's perhaps no painting of which this is truer. It's like a heroic diagram. The rope passing over that straining back indicates one arm of the X, and sight lines reinforce the other. The executioner looking at Peter's head while he's trying to heave the cross up vertical. St. Peter staring at the nail in his hand, defying the pain. But the details annoyed some people, particularly the feet of that executioner. Their labourers' feet, calloused and dirty, and to us that's part of the truth of the picture. When he turned to the conversion of St Paul, Caravaggio showed how completely he had escaped the narrative conventions of his time. A professional artist in 1600 would expect Paul to be the central figure, reeling backwards perhaps, but still on horseback, an equestrian monument to faith. Not Caravaggio, though. Again, he chose the climax of the action, for the voices spoken from the sky, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And the future apostle has been struck from his horse and lies on the ground, pinned like a beetle by that shaft of light. But the radiance that changes Paul's life is also quite matter-of-fact light, illuminating the brow of his groom and the side of his skewballed horse. This image is so entire, so compressed, that at first you don't notice how it bears the marks of the studio. A critic of narrative might object to the way that the groom is absorbed in holding the horse's head. He doesn't notice Paul on the ground. Caravaggio does not trouble to conceal the fact that he's brought a horse into the studio and an ocelot to hold it. No matter, the intensity with which he paints the light, mediating between the natural and the supernatural, won't be approached by any European artist until Rembrandt. But in what sense was he a realist? 
Realism's a very relative word. At one time or another, after all, it's been stretched to cover such exceedingly dissimilar figures as Velasquez and Bruegel and Corbet, Sir Alfred Munnings and the American photorealists, as well as Caravaggio himself. Realism, in any case, does not mean an unedited, comprehensive transcription of reality. It can't possibly mean that, because every second of the day, the world is drumming a steady tattoo on your eyeball, and most of it you edit out. There'd be no way of dealing with all that information. So what realism comes down to, inevitably, is choice. Now, when the choices are consistent, we begin to speak of style. But the limits of choice vary from painter to painter and from society to society, and they're always...